just going the last bit on this in this session and it's about praying for one another okay page 51 page 51 We all know we should pray with each other. We should pray for each other. But do we? Do we on a daily basis? Uh, it's very meaningful when it's on a daily basis. And um, you know, sit now? Yeah. Coming back. Okay. Um, supposing, you know, you've decided, okay, let's pray. I, I just, I want only hands up for this, okay? You've decided, let's pray at 7 p.m. today. By 5 p.m., what happens? Alama. <laughs> a different kind of, either the kids are squabbling, or your husband said something, or the wife has said something, husband's agitated. Have you noticed that, especially when you've decided we're going to pray together at this particular time? Um, then we, sometimes we go ahead and have a full-blown argument. Okay, we have a proper fight. And after the fight, what do we do? Finish fighting, now what to pray? You know what? Then only pray more. I'll tell you how. I'll just, I'll just break it down. So uh, I, I want to just tell you two things and then I'll you know, give you practical steps on this. Um, a pastor came when we were visiting India from Abu Dhabi. One of the pastors, uh, one of the people we knew, he just got married. So he said, okay, everything I wanted, God has blessed me with. I'm happy with my spouse. I said, super. He said, but I'm learning a lot of lessons which I never learned anywhere else. I said, good, uh, what happened? Give me one incident. I just said, we were, you know, I just met him on the go. Like, so I said, give me one incident. Tell me one thing. And he said the story which I never forgot. I'm sure he's forgotten it, but it stayed in my mind. And I want to tell you this. He said he's, he's used to his mother not talking back to his father. So when his wife had an opinion, he didn't know how to handle it. Okay. So he would, you know, one day they both, and she said, no, 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 but you must do it like this only. So he got more and more angry because how dare she talk back to me? That was his problem. This went on and finally they both, you know, squabbled with each other, said unnecessary words to each other, and then they went to sleep. And as, uh, you know, he said, see, we are, we are, you know, just into marriage. So she lay at that end of the double cot facing the wall. He lay at this end facing this side. Not even, you know, struggling to even breathe because you don't want to turn and touch each other. So he said, we were lying down like that. When suddenly I saw, I was half asleep and I saw someone in front of me. So my, you know, my ego tells me, he, I appreciate him for being humble enough to say the truth. He said, my ego tells me, good. And his eyes are closed, it seems. He's saying, good, my wife has come to say sorry to me. She jolly well say sorry to me. And he opened his eyes and he saw a huge demon standing in the room. And all that that said was, I won. I won. When we both squabble and when we separate even for a brief moment, it's not that, you know, I won the argument or he won the argument. The enemy thinks he won. We need to realize how serious it is, okay? Because all of us love God and we want to walk faithful to God. And you, don't, you know the devil is a loser. You know that you, know, you are more than conquerors. You know you're on the winning side and he's on the losing side. You know Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. And Jesus came that we might have life abundantly. All that we know. But somehow, sometimes, we allow the enemy to think he has won over us. I'll give you an example of what happened once when both of us had a squabble. We had decided to pray at 7. That's why the correct time came. So 7 o'clock and by 5, 6, both of us were really agitated about something that went wrong in, in the house. And, you know, we both let some words fly. And then at the end of it, my husband said, finish fighting, now what to pray? Uh, I said, no, no, we'll pray, no. So we both knelt down. And you know, the, as you, you know, we, we both have a funny bone, okay? So we knelt down, we're angry with each other, but we knelt down and close our eyes and we're just waiting for the other person to start praying and finish with an amen. And both of us had both eyes tightly closed and just, you know, we're waiting quietly. And slowly I opened one eye to see what he was doing. And he also opened one eye at that time to see what I was doing. Both of us burst out laughing. And what we did was we said, God, we first said sorry to each other. Because sometimes we say unnecessary words, which you yourself are ashamed of after that. You know, rude words, which that's not becoming of you. That's not you. 
That's not your nature. And so we both said sorry to each other and then we said sorry to God. Because sorry to God because we did not behave like his children. Imagine your kids fighting among themselves. It hurts you. You're a parent after all. He's a daddy God after all. So we said sorry to him. And then if you're able to resolve the issue at that point and pray through, great. But let me tell you, sorry is a very healing word when it comes to your unity. Okay? And so we prayed after that. And then we just said, Lord, we are not able to agree on the solution for this particular problem. But we know you know what is best. You see the future, God. Put the same thought in both of us. Actually, we pray that. I'll tell you there are umpteen times, many, many number of times when God has brought his idea. So it may be my husband's idea only finally, or it may be my idea only. And the urge to say, see, I told you then itself will be very strong. But don't do that because you're looking at unity building. We're looking at praying together, being one. You know, I've got a study Bible, which I, it's a real big one. So I keep it at home. And in that, it, it says, the Hebrew word, uh, Jay, you'll have to forgive me for this. I hope I'm saying it correct, okay? It says, sum fo ne ho, o, okay? The Hebrew word for agreement. You, we all know that when we agree, what, when you ask, it will be given to us. You know what this word actually means? It says, agreement in this, in the, this Hebrew word means harmony, symphony, absolute oneness. I want, to I want to just mention one thing here. Sometimes I've seen as couples, we pray at the top level, you know, Lord in Jesus' name. Yeah, we are agreeing and praying, Dulcie. What's your point? What, what are you trying to get at? You say, yes, finish agreeing. Lord, we both want this, you know, this child to be saved or say that I'm just taking it as a random example. And then we say in Jesus' name, amen. But both are not agreed at the heart level. I'll tell you, at the heart level, whatever you ask, he will do. Especially, 100% is when it's aligned to what he wants. Salvation of your child is what he wants. He will definitely do it. But he wants both of us to come together in absolute unity. And how many, you know, even one note goes wrong, it doesn't work for us. We know that. We all know that. So, uh, you know, we need to understand that's the kind of agreement which has a lot of power. I just want to say a few examples and then with that we'll find. What we do, we, we definitely make sure we say sorry with, to each other. And then we hand it over to God. We say, okay, God, in this situation, you overrule. We want your will. Do what you want. What you think is best in this situation. And, you know, within a week, within a month sometimes, we both will have the same thought toward that particular issue. We've seen conflicts resolved because we prayed together and gave it off to him to help us resolve it. At that time, we don't remember whose opinion it was. Jan 26, 2008, God told me, you will go. Both our children came off to India to study at that point of time. And God said, you will go back and live with your children. And I didn't want to come back alone because anyway, the company paid and handled my visa there. And I had a visa to stay with my husband. I said, my place is with you, not with the kids. So I'll pray for them, but somehow they will, they'll survive. But when God said, go back and live with your children, I told my husband, he said no, because he was peaking in his career. And, you know, it, he was really reaching the top. And uh, February 20, so I just told God, I said, you told me, my husband hears your voice. Please speak to him as well. I'm ready. I didn't tell this in front of my husband, obviously. I just said, Lord, I've, I've surrendered it to you. You speak to him. If you really want us both to go back, I'm fine with it. 20th February, my husband had come down to India for something, and he called back and said, sweetheart, we're returning to India. I said, why? He said, God said, go back to the land of your fathers. Very specific from Genesis. I said, done. I said, yes, Pa. So the next question was, what do you want us to do when we go back to India? Do we go in for a you know, corporate job? Does he go in for a job? Or do we go in for full time? What's on your mind? We need to hear you, God. God gives us a lot of details. That's beside the point. July tw 2008. This all happened from January, okay? July 2008, we returned to India. Lock, stock, and barrel. Shipped all our things down. Both of us came back to India. November 2008, Lehman Brothers fell. World had an economic meltdown. I'll tell you, as a couple, when you both pray, no, and God speaks to you, and you say, God, and even if only one person is convinced about it, 
hand it over back to God because he only spoke, no? I give it back to him and say, you do what you think is best in this. I'm ready for it. I'm fully ready for it. It's not that, God, I have to nag my husband till he obeys you. That's none of our business. That's a, you know, once God told me, Dalsi, your helper, ma. Holy Spirit is capital H. You are only small H. You get the point? But we think it's our job to convince and convict and change. That doesn't work. I'll be honest with you, it doesn't work. It's easier to kneel down and tell him, not grumble. Say, Lord, this whole thing is in your beautiful hands. Work things out the way you want it to work. And God works it out. Another time, I'll tell you one last example. Okay, a couple of things. Sometimes the answer has taken a year or two or even three or even four years. But my thing is, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. So in his time, he'll work it out. Why are we fretting? Allow him to do it in his time. And I feel led to say this, you know, um, even in terms of children bearing children, God taught me there is a time, just wait for it. And I've just knelt down and one of our children doesn't have children. I've just submitted to God and taken my hands off and said, God, in your time, you said you'll do it, you'll do it. Take care of that. So sometimes it doesn't come. Five years, seven years have gone by now. It doesn't come the way we think, oh, you get the kids married, do you must be having grandkids straight away. No. You get what I'm saying? I'm just making myself vulnerable. I just want you to know we all have some things that doesn't get answered. But when you hand it over to him, about the family, about your spouse, he just takes it on. And in his time, he makes it beautiful. Let's just move on a little more. Sometimes God will give you a word. For me, actually, that Jan 26th, he specifically gave me a word from the Bible which says, you will go back and live with your children. You know, that's what the Bible says. So that's what I held on to and God finally worked out. So when God gives you a word, write it down in your diary, pray it through and just keep submitting it back to him. Pray with understanding, pray in the spirit. Holy Spirit is our best intercessor. Pray till the burden lifts. That's the whole thing I learned about prayer. And I want to just, you know, say one last thing. In, um, when did we leave for the U.S.? Okay. Uh, in 98, 97, 1997, we were living in city. Our children were small. My mother-in-law was alive at the time. She was living with us. And at that point of time, I was, you know, traveling to Parapai, to this farm place. My dad had passed away in 95 December, so we were trying to run the place there. It was a camp center. So we were trying to, you know, shunt up and down. I would go on a bike up and down and handle the whole thing. And um, one day I got delayed there, and I took my bike, and I came back as I was coming back. And it was a very, 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 very lonely road, totally not developed mud roads. And as I was coming back halfway through, there's one village, particular village, which is called a murder village, because invariably they would, you know, really, really, it was really a base at that point of time. From there, two guys on a moped, OK? Now, I was on a, what, active, huh? What you got me? Yeah, kinetic Honda. So I was on this bike, but the roads were so bad, and you know, no street lights, nothing. So I'm just riding. These guys start chasing me, and fields on both sides. You know, I suddenly knew what their intent was. I got scared. I started racing. They are racing at breakneck speed behind me. I go, and then in the distance I see a bus. So I tell myself, if I overtake and go in front of the bus, these fellows. You know, they can't do anything to me. So I race and I overtake this bus and I'm going in front. The bus guy is horning. He's thinking I'm mad, you know, because he's clipping it on an empty dirt road. So I'm just going in his light. I want to stay safe there. I, I clip it. At that point of time, suddenly one wave of bicycles came out of one factory there. They call it Atta Company. So one whole, you know, carton uh, factory. About 100, I reach. Finally, I go right across town reach my house. And as I take my helmet off and I'm going upstairs to the, you know, we lived on the first floor, first, up, first floor apartment. As I'm going up there, my husband opens the door and he said, what happened? You know, I'm just shocked. Mind you, no mobile phones, this is 1997. And I just looked at him and I said, how do you know? And uh, over his, he just hugged me tight, you know? He just squished my face against his shoulder. And he said, I said, how do you know? And my mother-in-law behind him, she was crying. 
my kids were scared my kids were tiny at that point of time both of them just looking at me like that so i said how do you know so my mother in law said in tears she said correctly at 7:30 that's the time these two guys far away nearly 35 kilometers away are chasing me maybe to rape who knows what okay my husband's at home and he suddenly came into the ho- dining room where my kids were watching some kiddie cartoons with my mother in law and said switch that thing off dulcies in danger we need to pray and he starts talking in tongues walking up and down in that little house that we lived in small little place and he starts saying god your protection is on her your blood will cover her you will protect her that's all he said and he went on talking in tongues and my mother in law was crying and was you know really praying that god would keep me safe whatever you know what you have a lot of power over what happens all the enemy attacks have to bow before you when you pray for your spouse and i feel that's the closest i feel that's the closest i dread to think if i didn't have a praying husband if i didn't have a man who was sensitive in the spirit to pick it up that his job was to pray for me at that point of time i dread to think what would have happened that day i dread i don't know you know we as husband and wife we don't know the power of our praying together but there's one evil one that knows the devil knows that's why he stops us from praying together i believe no resolving conflict a lot can be done through prayer a lot can be done using these steps but pack it up with prayer it smoothens out the worst of conflict some of the conflicts we've had if i if i had to tell you you will be shocked worst of conflicts we find the holy spirit coming through praying through helping us to build each other helping us to pray with each other through the nasty times through the tough times you know praying together matters a lot i pray that today you'll as a couple make a decision every day we are going to pray one of the things in the morning i mean this comes in this notes here one of the things you could do is ask your spouse how to pray for them what to pray for you know and god will answer so many times i've done that for my husband as he's you know we pray as he's going to leave and then the evening time we pray together again that was before when he was in the corporate so i would just tell him what is it specifically what you want me to pray for you and whole day I, that would be my my prayer that will be a part of what i do in my day and god has answered every time maybe not in a day sometimes months but he's answered he's come through so last exercise page 51 turn to your spouse hold your spouse's hand and uh, ask what you're concerned about okay what is it that is bothering you at this moment and uh, pray for each other husband pray for your wife wife pray for your husband take to uh, take 5 minutes actually 2 minutes each so in we think oh he's an angry man so many women i've heard them say oh he's an angry man what to do with him i said but what do you do to express your anger so i ah, he'll just you know think suddenly one day i'll nicely shout so my point is hedgehog anger or rhino anger what is visible on the outside or what we just hold on inside but it's actually festering anger is anger okay and we need to deal with it we have to have anger management in fact value education for 7th graders i'm writing on anger management i'm teaching them how to deal with anger how to handle it how to not let anger handle you sometimes anger handles us we need to learn how to handle anger we are the winners we are on the winning side we need to have that attitude and say hey i'm going to make this anger subdue to what god wants so now we're just going to go in for our first exercise on page 60 identify whether you're more like a rhino or more like a hedgehog when you're hurt if you're not sure ask your partner 5 <laughs> minutes
all right unless we manage anger properly it will lead to a downward spiral you know when we get married you know we start sharing our life with our spouse you know gradually we open up you know uh, we say everything about us you know we let down our defenses you know this transparency this openness and this actually leads to intimacy you know but when we are doing this when hurt comes when one hurts the other what happens is we kind of withdraw you are worried about you know what to say we try you know that intimacy is affected now in order for that intimacy that transparency to be restored this hurt has to be healed now if this hurt is not healed what happens is we get stuck there we get stuck there trust you know the whole idea of sharing with uh, openness is to build trust so in this whole cycle of trust when you are open when you are sharing when hurt comes and when that hurt is not resolved you know you kind of go back you go back if hurt is resolved then that openness is there the trust is there the transparency is there and trust keeps building you know in marriage this is so so vital for us to build trust and intimacy now this this session is about hurt you know what are the reactions to hurt dalsi just shared about you know the rhino and the uh, hedgehog yeah. these are actually symptoms or are responses to hurt and what happens we retaliate we the, these are ways of telling our partner i'm angry i'm upset i'm hurt and what happens after that between us that intimacy is lost intimacy is lost and we start actually instead of you know that fearlessness that uh, intimacy we start actually uh, fearing we that uh, spontaneity is lost spontaneity is lost because of this you know harbored anger because of anger that is not resolved because of uh, hurts that are not resolved we have physical problems turn with me to page 61 61 what happens if hurt and anger are buried people think you know we are not talking about it it happened la you know so many years ago many months ago no it's still there unless it is resolved unless it's resolved and look at the problems behavioral problems you know inability to re- relax low sexual desire quick temper intolerance escape through drugs alcohol and pornography escape into work children religious activities actually it's very strange people think doing ministry will resolve that no oh, that that they are totally that has to be addressed for you to be whole as a person you can do ministry but that doesn't help and uh, i know you know in a government office when we first started doing this in 2012 my brother in law used to say uh, talk about you know some people coming to saturday on work for work saturday is like a holiday why they don't want to go home it's more peaceful in the office you know unless this is resolved you will you know you escapism you know going into work escape into work not only government office even private offices <laughs> all right physical sy- symptoms disturbed sleep actually this is a direct consequence you know you because you're thinking about it your mind cannot rest your mind cannot rest appetite is affected medical conditions the emotional symptoms loss of positive emotions romance love and joy actually that romance is the first thing that will go you can't talk like you were talking to your wife in your honeymoon you know that's it's gone so yeah low self esteem shutting down do you notice any of these symptoms in yourself from burying hurt and anger we're going to do this exercise page number 62 page number 62 for each of these on the left hand side i want you to give a score for yourself overact and go on an attack 
if that is you always give yourself a four never it's zero let's take 10 minutes for this let's start yeah. all right sir looks like most of you have done you have, you're, you're done with it uh, please total total each column column a and column b and in one one course somebody said sir i got 20 <laughs> i said this is the wrong exam to get 20 <laughs> and uh, in another place they said sir he is rhino they thought you know rhino was bad and hedgehog was good so, you know, both are uh, expressions of, uh, you know, hurt that is not healed. So, number two, at times of disagreement, what words or phrases are you aware that you use that hurts your partner? You know, it's not the score. Sometimes, you know, that one word, that one expression, you know, that can, that can, that can hurt. You know, we were returning from... Uh, um, Uti after a wedding and we we're having uh, uh, breakfast at a hotel that you know uh, in Metupale and uh, in that hotel I, I had already gone and I was there at the table and uh, Dalsi was there at the other end of the corridor we have a you know code among ourselves uh, you know for when I want to call her I, there's a particular whistle tone so you know uh, she knows that I'll, I'm calling but that also was you know you can't hear. So what I did was I clapped. I clapped and she turned and I tell you that upset us so much. We were driving back from Metapalim to Chennai. That was... Can I also say the story? <laughs> oh, you're back. Not my version. But imagine you're in a hotel. There are people there all over. He clapped every, and he clapped loud. He claps really loud. He clapped two loud claps, no? Everyone turned and looked at him and they, you know, where he was looking, they directed their eyes. So I enter and imagine all of you suddenly stare at me because at the end of the room, my husband's clapped and I've got to walk up there. My face just fell, okay? <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> so I just write down, you know. What is it that hurt your partner? There might be a word. And I tell you, uh, I will never clap <laughs> 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 to call. <laughs> might even call and shout, <laughs> but I will never clap. Right. So uh, what are some of the words that you've used that are, you know, uh, hurt? Your score, actually, score is just an indicator, you know, an indicator how much pronounced it is or how less. But uh, write down words that, you know, this is actually, a, this session is about soul searching. This session is about you, about you, yourself, okay? Um, so write down. And what, what, number three, what words and phrases does your partner use, if any, that hurt you? So, uh, you know, this is not a time to exchange notes, but you, you note it down, you know? Words that you use to hurt the other person and your partner uses, that will hurt you. Four and five, you know, um, this is uh, the uh, hedgehog, you know. Are the times of uh, times of disagreement, are you able to express your feelings? You know, this is uh, a person who's hurt and who's got the hedgehog tendency, uh, which means you shut, you know, shut down. You're not able to express, and uh, that is very dangerous. Okay, so uh, this is worse. Oh, sorry, not worse. <laughs> Point five. If if not, how could you help your partner to do so? Especially if he or she is like a uh, has got a, a more points on the hedgehog behavior. Uh, we need to actually see how we can address this to help our spouse. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing this now. Please note this down. I'm 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 going to, going to request you to please. Do it at home, all right? We're going to the next part, which is page 64. Okay. How many of us know that we should forgive one another? All of us know. We've learned it in Sunday school, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive. That means how much I forgive you only, God will forgive me. 
that's the understanding lot of preachers have said i'm still uh, i'm yet to hear what god has to tell me on that personally i'm wanting to know that okay but the point is this we know we should forgive how many how many of us actually forgive sometimes it comes spontaneously you're able to forgive and go on but sometimes it doesn't yeah now whether you've hurt your partner or not i'm on page 64 right now okay or have been hurt by my spouse take the initiative to bring it out into the open so things can be healed okay uh, i remember thorn on my foot and i as a kid and i said no 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 i'm fine i was a barefooted runner i loved running on in the open air so and i grew up on a farm so uh, i you know i just said no it's okay i'll be fine my parents tried to sit me down and pull the thorn out i said no chance i'm fine but some days went by and then i couldn't even walk i had to you know my foot was curling up like this way because of the thorn and then it festered and then they put hot am i this is my grandmother's my grandmother's alive at the time they put hot oil boiling hot oil and you know touched a big bundle of cloth in it and touched my foot all around till they could just press and the whole thing jumped out so sometimes hurt when stuffed inside we think we are fine we are not fine we think you know there's a when demo we usually do about an you know weird kind of an equilibrium we twist each other's hand and then we're running through life we're trying to go through life like this papa you pulling me down <laughs> okay so we go through life struggle somehow finish and go on that's not the purpose that god got us married for you know god's got something beautiful if only we are willing to you know let everything else down and say god what do you want and see him heal but the only thing i'd say is this you know my the pastor the reverend uh, we, where we got married 35 years ago he you know they had this counseling for the couple so he called us individually then he called us together and when he sat us down he said one thing he said don't get angry at the same time i'll never forget that so i said doesn't make sense to me what are you saying both of us both of us are agitated about the same thing then what what's the point in saying don't get angry he said no when one person is angry the other person control yourself tell yourself no i'm not going to get you know i'm not getting thing but my point for that was there is a right time to address something we saw that earlier right there is a like this 10 o'clock rule there is a time to address something when both of you are getting heated up it doesn't help to try to address it it doesn't work at that point of time but we need to talk and i always believe in this thing there is a season to talk there is a season to keep quiet that's the word of god so when we need to talk but the truth is we need to address it we can't ignore it we can't think if i ignore it long enough it will go away it doesn't the small hurts if left un- unaddressed build you know become small stones and then eventually it will come and you know block your whole relationship we've been seeing that in you know start of this now math i like this message version if you suddenly remember a grudge your partner has against you that's a beauty it's not even what grudge you are having against him i always tell god this why 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 that person's grudge i have to you know stop giving my gift at the altar why should i uh, you know go immediately and make things right with them but this is what the word of god says and jesus says it himself if you suddenly remember a grudge your partner has against you leave immediately go to your partner and make things right and then 1815 down here in the same page on page 64 he says if your partner offends you go and tell them work it out between the two of you so uh, i always believe there is a time there is a right time to talk things out but it has to be addressed we can't just ignore it for life and imagine it'll go away it's like a pressure cooker one fine day safety valve uh, gasket everything will go hit the ceiling if we allow it to you know just stay there for too long right we are in page 65 apology or uh, saying sorry most of us have this urge you know to have an excuse for not saying sorry right and uh, one of the cardinal uh, <laughs> yeah okay so we blame our partner our excuse for not asking sorry is she is wrong or he is wrong 
right? I know I criticized you in front of the children yesterday, but, you know, I wouldn't have done it if you did not do this, you know, like that. You know? So constantly, our, uh, the, I, and I tell you, this is real. This is real. Because we are human beings, we are, you know, we want to appear perfect, though we are imperfect inside. So making excuses. A proper apology is, you know, saying what you did and asking sorry. I hurt you by criticizing you in front of our children yesterday. It was unkind of me. I am sorry. That's a good apology. Actually, uh, somebody said there are 12 very important words. There are four sentences. I am wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I'm wrong, I'm sorry, please, please forgive me, I love you. That's a good apology, right? Okay, so making excuses and blame, blaming a partner. I know I was grumpy, rude towards you last night, but you don't understand what intense pressure I have been under work uh, for the last two weeks. All that will be there, but uh, we can't give that as an excuse, right? Proper apology. It was selfish and insensitive of me to be rude and grumpy towards you last night. I'm sorry to have hurt you. You know, apologizing is actually a mark of a mature believer. And apologizing to your wife. Normally, wives will apologize to your husbands in our culture. But the husband apologizing to the wife is a mark of a mature marriage. Right? So... Uh, Let's not think we are, uh, you know, we have come down a few levels. When we are wrong, we are wrong. It's a marriage that has to be saved. It is a marriage that has to be good. We need to recognize, realize, and apologize when we have to. Right. Paige? Yeah. Yeah, so the next exercise, this is probably the longest exercise before we go. Uh, before we wind up. So we will take 20 minutes. 20 minutes for this next exercise. Now, this is one of the most important parts of this session, you know. A session on forgiveness. Most people miss this out. Meaning, life goes on. Uh, hurt that is there. You may have, your spouse also may have. But this is often overlooked. This exercise will help us to identify. All right? <clears throat> there are two parts. The first part is trying to identify your partner's hurt. Think about ways in which you've hurt your partner and affected your marriage that have not been resolved between you. Think back to when you were going out, when you were engaged, and the early times of your marriage, as well as the recent times. Ask yourself, what have I failed to do that I should be doing? What have I done or I'm still doing that I should not do? Where have I failed to meet my partner's needs? What have I said that has been hurtful? What have I left unsaid that could have shown love and encouragement? Okay, so this is the time to actually write down. Write down the things that come to your mind. This is, you know, personal. I want you to just make notes. Now again, like I said, this is that, that couple actually started making this in the class. And they continued it that night at 10 o'clock. Went on till 3 a.m. in the morning. They were serious about resolving, uh, uh, sorry, identifying the hurt that they realized that was the reason that they could not relate with each other. They were doing ministry, but they could not, right? So some examples have give, are, are given here to help us to think. I have stopped being affectionate and rejected your initiatives to make love. I have fallen asleep in front of the television instead of talking with you. I've been out more consistently with work colleagues or friends than we have together as a couple. I said some very unkind things during that big argument we had two weeks ago about money. 
Okay, so uh, I'll just run through the second part and I want to give time for us to actually write down. This is highly personal. This is ways in which you have hurt your spouse. Now the other side, flip side, part two. Identify your own hurt. Hurt which your partners have, you know, uh, caused. Identify the ways in which you have been hurt by your partner. The cause of the hurt could be recent or long time ago. Your partner might or might not be aware of hurting you. And it could have been one incident or repeated many times. Make sure you're specific and that you describe how you felt. Okay? Uh, you don't have to write the full story here. Make, uh, uh, you know, the points there. And uh, we're going to have time to do something after that. Okay, um, normally for this session, we go to, you know, in our farm, we go to different places, it's a big place. Now we're not able to do that. I'm going to ask them to rev up the music a little more. Okay, and uh, at this time, actually once you're done with your list, you're actually going to talk to each other. We did that exercise on listening, right? Responsive listening and uh, listening to reflective, reflective listening. Uh, you're going to actually take this list and share it with each other. You're going to show each other and uh, you're going to start this exercise of, you know, when you're saying this, your spouse can have, you know, if you have a question, you can ask, but don't give an excuse and shut that down, okay? If this is something that is there, that's why it's come up, but I want you to help to identify, clarify, so that you will understand the cause of the hurt. If you've been the cause of the hurt for your spouse, you actually do the apology. You know, say, I, yes, I did this. And when you say that, I, when I did this, I made you feel like this. You were humiliated in front of my children. You felt so humiliated in front of the whole hotel. You know, you say that and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The reason it's part A and part B is because you think the other person has hurt, but you may not know what you have done. That's why, you know, you write what you have hurt, how you have hurt your partner and how you've been hurt. Both of you do that and bring it together. Okay? Now, if there's nothing, please don't go and dig for something. <laughs> yeah. Let's start. Uh, I know this is not conclusive. Some of you may have come up with things that were shocking, you know, you didn't expect, and your spouse said, this hurt me, and uh, you expressed to your spouse, and he or she was shocked. Now, uh, let this not rattle you. Um, there are things that you started, you actually started a conversation, and you're not able to continue because this is not the setting. You might have to actually go home and in a quiet ambience and when you are also cool, um, continue that. And uh, one thing, you know, there are words that we might have said even in this exercise which did not actually convey the right meaning. I think you need to take time. This is something that we need to take time and I strongly recommend that you continue this same evening, this evening, you know, you've invested Saturday for this. Morning to evening, yes, but you know, this is very crucial, very critical for uh, settling this, you know. Once you settle this in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, you're able to resolve this. Okay, the question about forgiveness is just this. Do I want to get even or do I want to get well? Do I want to show you, okay, you hurt me, no, I'll show you... I'll show you how it feels. Or the other option is to say, no, I want you to be well. I want to be well. Have you ever tried carrying a chair, if I may? I mean, if you had time, I would have done this. I would have made you all carry a chair above your head. How long can you carry it? Five minutes? Ten minutes? After that, your hands get tired, right? How can we carry unforgiveness? 
it's much more than this it's like putting five you know tomatoes in your handbag and believing it will be safe there you put a bible on it you put a book on it or you put a laptop on it and then you think it will be fine within two days it will start stinking the whole place up that's what unforgiveness does when we realize that that's when that you know that thing hey i i want to be released that comes in i want to be well i want my marriage to be well i want yes i'm hurt yes she's hurt he's hurt but how can i just see the whole thing uh, how can i forgive how can i release forgiveness so that's what we're going to talk about now and uh, first thing is forgiveness is a choice it's not a feeling i choose to forgive because i know i want the relationship to be well i value our relationship more than my hurt or my ego i value the relationship more when that is our heart you will start seeing things smoothen out in terms of you know hurt and in a thing the point is when i say i cannot forgive i'm actually saying i choose not to forgive okay now forgiveness is not you change i'll forgive you okay romans 5:8 it's a beautiful verse it says while we were yet sinners christ died for us what a verse what love like we said that's our culture that's the kingdom culture we live in the worst of times even when the spouse is doing the worst thing say lord i choose to forgive him or i choose to forgive her because you loved me like that when i didn't deserve i didn't do anything to deserve your love in fact what the amount god loved us it was a gamble whether this human race you and i would ever turn and look at him still he gave still he loved okay while we were yet sinners christ so it's not that if he changes or she changes then i'll forgive that's not the way you know forgiveness works forgiveness is not if i ignore it long enough it will go away i told you about the pressure cooker forgiveness is letting go letting go how far will this come i can't hold on to anything here okay imagine i'm holding on to this okay it's like unforgiveness i'm holding on to this and i'm trying to progress in life i won't go i won't go far i might become old on the outside my teeth might fall off i might become all gray head but i inside me there's a part that freezes where we choose not to forgive when we realize that no we realize where we get stunted because of my decision not to forgive that particular insult or that particular hurt or that particular thing that my spouse did to me so when we understand that forgiveness is i have to let go because i don't want to be stunted in that area for the rest of my life you know the one place that we hold on to that becomes bitter and hardens that place will never find progress the rest of you might even do ministry but in that one place if you are not able to forgive you won't find progress we'll just move on you know some are trapped by their own bitterness and anger it's like you know we draw a cage around us we think we are free but we are so angry that we trap ourselves in fact jesus calls this kind of bitterness he calls it torturers actually it tortures you i remember in one of the sessions we were doing the fifth session in one of the places in um, camp they had asked us to speak on marriage so we were doing the fifth session about you know family relationships with a larger family and one girl at the end of it she came her face was contorted she walked up to my husband and say you say forgive okay i will not forgive my mother in law and we just uh, you know i just stood there we both stood there for some time and then my husband just very politely looked at her and said and she said but the good thing this this woman tortured me for 3 years that's about her mother in law and she said the good thing my husband is now and she meant, mentioned another country and she said he's gone there i am also he'll get my visa i'll also go off there and i won't even come anywhere near this woman again she was talking about her mother in law and then my husband we just both just listened for a minute and i was you know in tongues inside when i don't know what to say tongues is an easier way to figure out what god wants to say there so i was just keeping quiet and my husband told her one thing 
he said okay ma you go you go to this particular country but you know what you'll carry your mother in law there in your head that's what torturer means that's what jesus says when he says hand them over to the torturers those who don't forgive okay and i have discovered torture is actually not physical torture it's it's a mental thing and that battle is the most challenging you can even handle a physical battle not a mental battle it's a most challenging thing in life so forgiveness or bitterness unforgiveness when we decide not to forgive we are trapping ourselves into that so if the person does the same mistake again and again and again and again you know enthu peter i call him an enthu cutlet he says he thought he was very smart he said how many times can i forgive lord seven times seven like you know he's throwing a number at jesus <laughs> jesus caught him he said not seven times peter 70 times seven meaning to say forgiveness has to become your habit whether the offender is doing the same thing again or not whether they change or not for you forgiveness has to become a habit and we'll just when you can't forgive what to do romans 5 i've i've gone back i've gone back to god not in terms of my spouse but in terms of ministry a hurt that was so deep an offense that was so deep okay and i struggled we both struggled because i just couldn't get over it i couldn't rise above that at all and i one day i went to god i said god i really can't forgive that person for the they were really nasty lord they were absolutely mean and uh, i said just do something i can't preach i can't talk this is much before all the marriage course and everything for me even standing in front of a kid and talking i had to be right with god i said i can't talk on your love lord tell me what to do and then god put my heart romans 55 but the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts through the holy spirit so i kept going back to the holy spirit and saying give me that love give me the ability to love those people those who you know really messed me up give me the ability to love them i want to just say a few things here which god put in my heart as we were preparing for this day and i want to just say this one don't listen to the lies of the enemy in handling hurt i teach teenagers i talk to them about handling how to handle with their parents how to relate to their parents and when i'm talking to them about handling hurt the one thing i tell them the first thing i tell them is figure out whether what you're believing is truth or lie that's a first step to handling hurt so i you know what was that person's intention you don't know so you go when you can't love anymore ask holy spirit to help you and don't listen to the enemy when the enemy says you know my hubby hates me i've heard people say that or the you know they say my wife doesn't respect me and so many other things half truth half lie make sure you're bel- you believing the absolute truth even in terms of that wrong don't allow half truth you know if i told you i i uh, you know your teeth are red you'd say no obviously you know your teeth are not red but if you are a person who uses close up red color call a uh, close up toothpaste in the morning and if i come and tell you you used close up in the morning no your teeth are red let me guarantee i'll turn my back you'll go and look in a mirror half truth half lie the enemy does that he doesn't take absolute lie and come and present it to us and in relationships i have discovered and we have discovered that sometimes we believe a half lie about our spouse that itself hinders forgiveness that itself stops us from making up or becoming friends again because you think this is what is right i perceive this and i think it is right but actually that could be wrong that could be a lie of the devil so we just need to you know keep going back to god and seeing what he's telling us now forgiveness another thing god taught me was is not forgetting they say no forgive and forget forgiveness is not forgetting so i told god tell me what is forgetting what is forgiveness then i talk about this incident again and again lord what is forgiveness where have i forgiven those people are you forgiving me because i have i forgiven i don't even know if i've forgiven so at that point god told me one thing and i i heard his voice and he just told me one thing he said 
when you stop those when those emotional upheaval stop when you narrate the story you have actually forgiven them when your whole emotion doesn't get churned up when you're talking about what happened there then you have not forgiven them yet but you forgiven them when you're not you know it's not churning you up again it's just a narrative it's just going at this level you're fine you've forgiven the person so that's we don't forget it okay we when you don't have an up, emotional upheaval when you think of it then rest assured you have forgiven the person now forgiveness does not mean i'm weak and pathetic i want all of us men and women because i find now more and more and more and more even in my age i find many people saying why should i forgive what all i've sacrificed in life why should i forgive and you know why should i bring myself down to forgive that's the question i want to just say it doesn't mean you're weak and pathetic only a strong person can sacrifice and forgive jesus is our model he's my model he's our model we need to understand he forgave us when we were going on doing wrong things he still decided to come and die for us and the same jesus is saying forgive i'll forgive you father will forgive forgive others their sin as it should be forgiven to you if that is what he says and if that is what he has demonstrated then he is the model he is not weak he is not a pathetic god i know a guy who you know said who laughed at my daughter in school one of the lecture teachers when she was in school and he said ha ah, this jesus all the time on the cross ah, he was imitating i made i gave her a script to go back and tell him and you know tell him that my god is not a weak pathetic god forgiving doesn't mean you're weak and pathetic forgiving means you are walking like your master when you forgive your spouse you're walking the way he wants you to walk you're allowing his forgiveness to flow through you to each other that foot at the end of that page page 68 get rid of all bitterness there are two verses written there rage and anger be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in christ god forgave you my husband came out with a nice nice uh, acronym with a nice acronym kfc kind hearted forgiving compassionate can we say that together kind hearted forgiving compassionate can we say that again kind hearted let's just close our eyes and pray hold your spouse i'll pray and my husband will pray and conclude after that yeah before we conclude uh, you know i just want to take you through pages 73 and 74 now we've looked at asking apology we've looked at um uh, we've looked at identifying hurts and we looked at releasing forgiveness you know this is complete when we do th- three steps number 1 we come to the lord and say lord thank you for helping me which we are in page 73 thank you for helping me helping those who uh, okay that prayer is basically saying god thank you for helping me identify where i have hurt my spouse and asking god forgiveness and asking god to help uh, the healing to happen and asking god to help to reconcile with one another and then you go to your spouse that is uh, page 74 and uh, t- tell your partner sorry i'm so sorry for mentioning exactly what you did and how you hurt say i know it hurts you and makes you feel you know the way she feels he feels and from now on i intend to what you do for restitution and say please forgive me right when this is done then the one who's uh i've been forgiven you say i release forgiveness i forgive you okay you ask the person who has asked forgiveness you tell him or her yes i release forgiveness i forgive you i tell you this is what completes the cycle and now you will be able to comfort one another can you hold your spouse's hand if you can hug your her spouse that is good you're one you're no longer two but one Father in heaven we come to you we thank you lord for every word that you spoken 
from morning, Father God. So many things, Father God. And many of these things we have started thinking, we've started working on. But Lord, we have not concluded, we have not completed. But we want to thank you, Lord. I believe, Father God, you have must have stirred up certain things. Many things that were down, hidden, the Lord has stirred up. But don't worry, this is not a murky water. God has stirred it up so that you will remove what needs to be removed. And he is the one, the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, cleanses us from all sin. When we confess, he forgives. When we confess, he forgives. And now is the time. Father, we ask you very specially in this session, Lord, there are so many hurts that we have caused. And our partner, our spouse, is really hurt. We have not bothered to address that. And now we come to you. We are sorry, Lord. Sorry that we have been the cause for this hurt in our spouse's life. Please forgive me. Please forgive me, Lord. Say that with heart. God will lead you. Please forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Let your blood, Lord, I pray your blood will cleanse me. And Father, I pray that you will heal this hurt in my spouse's life. Lord, I pray there will be a great restoration, yes, Lord. a great reconciliation, a great coming together because we are not two, we are one. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray this union, one flesh union, spirit, soul, and body will happen, Father God. Everyone here, every one of the couples, Father, yes, we Lord. pray in Jesus' name. We are one. This is the plan of God. Amazing plan of the architect. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for all people's church. We bless this church. May they multiply. Father, thank you for Pastor Asish. Thank you for Pastor Jay. Thank you for their families. Thank you, Lord, for the leaders, all those who worked, Father God. We bless them. May this church be blessed. In you, the families of the earth will be blessed. Let this blessing be upon everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen.